here. This is an exciting moment for me. Um, the, the long title, you can start reading now. Uh, it's, it's, really, it's really two talks in one, but one I'm going to be talking about work that I've done with Dudley over the uh, last 40 years in this, uh, this part of the world. And the, the second part is to emphasize the importance of intact landscapes in uh, understanding important biological problems. There are lots of reasons for intact landscapes. This is just another one that's not so obvious. And um, so that's me 40 years ago as my field vehicle. 40 years ago, that's right near the northernmost site of, of uh, the study I'm going to talk about. And just, just briefly, uh, this is the area that everybody drives through to get to somewhere else. And it's a phenomenal area, what's left of it. And I hope to make that point in this talk. Um, Dudley of Britain, I, the subject of this is a, a Baja California, northwestern Baja California endemic that's really abundant in the area where it grows. It's a beautiful plant, um, with big, big rosettes. It has glaucous and non glaucous or green forms. It's restricted to just specific patches within a really spitting distance of the ocean in a narrow maritime strip. Uh, well, geez, <laughs> pardon me. Uh, uh, that that is, uh, ranges from Rosarita Beach down uh, to uh, well south of Ensenada. The study area uh, is north of Ensenada between Rosarito and uh, El Sosal, and it, it's centered on an area where this glaucous uh, form occurs, which is indicated by blue. And the, the green one is also there, and then throughout that green colored uh, area um, <coughs> there. Uh, so this is uh, the northernmost study site. I, I came across this as I was going further south to do other things, uh, including that flora potabonda, and then I worked on Dudley as looking at physiological ecology. Uh, but I noticed this uh, flowering time phenomenon, and I started to attempt to study it systematically. Well, things have changed in 40 years. Um, well, for one, I have an adult, a couple of adult sons, and uh, um, this is a, basically the same spot. Um, here there's these uh, landmarks on an air photo from Google Earth, and I'm standing on Google Earth's shoulders and Reed Morin's shoulders here. Um, and then these are views from that uh, place and a view of that place. So uh, a, lot of, a lot of developments going on. What's not so obvious, uh, unless you get up above the landscape, is there's been a lot of development of uh, tracks, of, of roads and stuff to preparing for, for housing. And that's, that's really uh, pretty commonplace, at least as far down as Descanso, and then it gets more interrupted. So that's something that you don't really notice, and it's uh, really insidious. Um, but, you know, uh, so here we have the green and glaucous uh, forms, and they hybridize, and uh, you can find all forms of the spectrum in terms of the degree of glaucescence, and it's clearly inherited, and the different degrees have to do with back crossing of F1s to either parental type. Uh, the hybrids are in low abundance in any population, uh, less than 5%, um, but they do exist, and, uh, um, and that's part of the story. Uh, habitats, where the two forms grow together, the uh, glaucous form uh, is on these steep volcanic bluffs of a specific Miocene uh, volcanic formation. Below the bluffs, the slope uh, uh, gets less steep, and then you have green and glaucous together. And then as you get farther away on the flats, and this is the most physically vulnerable habitat to development, but on old green terraces and where the vegetation isn't so thick that, that a Dudley can't compete, these things will be growing out on these, on these uh, terraces. Um, the other thing I want to point out, besides the vulnerability of the habitat of the green, is when you get out of 
the area where the glaucous one occurs. The green one has much greater habitat amplitude, and it'll be on slopes like this, you know, no problem. But uh, and uh, the, the, the glaucous ones uh, beat them to it. Here are uh, some, uh, I'd say, characteristic habitats, but these are probably my best shots of them. And these are some old photos. Th this is a canyon. All the white dots on these canyon walls are uh, glaucous studlias. There's probably a green one in there, but I, I looked at the slides with a microscope and couldn't find one. Um, these these uh, flower stalks, all those red <coughs> flower stalks, are from the green form on a gentle uh, terrace. And then here's an area with both of them growing. In this case, the green ones are upslope on a gentle slope, and then the slope uh, uh, breaks, and the, the, the lower area here is rocky and it's covered with glaucous ones. A couple of important things for later. Uh, these don't vegetatively reproduce to any degree. It's reproductions by tiny seeds, like other dahlias. Um, the flower visitors are, are quite a variety, and I don't think there's a qualitative difference between the two forms as to what visits them. But uh, Costa's hummingbird here is prominent in sometimes in some places. Uh, a variety of native bees uh, introduce honeybees be visit them. Uh, and the other thing, uh, work with uh, Jeff Lemon and I um, years ago found that the, the seed set of pollinated flowers is almost double that of um, unpollinated flowers. So pollination really makes a difference uh, whether they're outcrossed or selfed. Uh, this is what got me started on uh, the interest in this. And uh, this is uh, the glaucous and green forms together. Um, Glaucus on this date really far advanced in flower to the green. Um, they have long flower stalks, but the buds haven't started to swell at all, so they're weeks from flowering. Um, the initial observations and questions I had were the green and glaucus forms were intermingled. The green form flowered later than the glaucus uh, plants and later than the green form did elsewhere. Uh, and that's important. The elsewhere part's important because you, you have to be able to have an intact landscape to see the elsewheres. Um, where the two forms aren't inter intermingled, the green form flowered earlier than it does where it's with the uh, glaucous form, and the, the flowering time of the two uh, forms overlap considerably. So why is there such a radical shift in flowering time, and how can, how can you systematically and objectively analyze this in more detail and document it, given the inability to just stay right there and visit each population every week. Uh, well, here's part of the answer. The inflorescence provides a, a, a snapshot of the, the flowering season with uh, the spent flowers, the, uh, the open flowers, and uh, buds. And knowing, as I uh, did, the uh, and not a time that elapsed between opening and adjacent flowers, which was about five days, you could uh, estimate when that particular inflorescence started, you know, for a specific date, and when it's going to finish. Um, the sampling design was uh, intended to separate abiotic factors from biotic factors as being causative. And uh, so, and I'll, I'll get onto this with the later slide. Here are the results. Um, these are traditional box and whisker plots with uh, a mean 95% uh, confidence interval and a range <coughs> depicted for each population. So there are five, uh, four populations of green plants south of the overlap zone. Uh, this is the beginning of flowering, this is the end, and the, the mean is uh, shaded in in green. So these are green to the north, green to the south of the zone of overlap. Here are the greens within the uh, zone of overlap, and I clicked twice. So we brought up the glaucus. So there's really strong overlap in the flowering period, so all of those things. But here's the news. This is uh, green with glaucus, uh, and if you, uh, each, the, the, each respective population, the green mean initiation of flowering, it's pretty coincident with the mean termination of flowering uh, of the glaucous form at that site. 
And then there was a little uh, transplant experiment done by the highway department uh, in the median of the toll road, and some of you might have seen this. Um, and it's plants from that area of overlap um, in a growing in the highway median. And uh, I won't dwell on this. I'll show a picture in a minute. But we have uh, several lines of evidence to talk about the origin of those. So this is the same data set shown in a different way, so you can really see the geography. And the main point here is the north and south of the zone of overlap. Everything's flowering at the same time and strongly overlapping with the flowering time of the glaucous plant. Then uh, on the right are four populations within the distribution of the glaucous form, but not uh, intermixed with them. And then here are four populations where they are intermixed, green and glaucous. And the glaucous and these are the dashed line, green is the uh, solid line. So you see the greens are really displaced uh, in flowering time compared to the glaucus in the, you know, it's months along the axis. So the displacement is on the order of six weeks or more. Uh, there's, a, uh, here's that uh, the transplant that was in the media. Uh, it's no longer there, but some of you have probably seen it. It was right approaching the toll booth uh, south of the uh, Rosarita Beach. Also did common garden experiments, and uh, the results of those uh, corroborate uh, what we saw in the field. And the, these are data from the corresponding uh, populations from that other data set. Uh, the big flowers are the plants are in full flower, and the other symbols you can kind of figure out. But this this really closely matches what we saw in the field 14 years earlier. So. And, uh, and this is growing in a common garden in Carpinteria. So uh, briefly, the conclusions, the study documents uh, reproductive character displacement over very short distances. And I meant to call, show this, uh, but uh, a couple of the populations were within a kilometer of another, one another, and the green forms were shifted uh, six weeks. Uh, the differences appear to be genetic, and uh, given the differences that we can talk about later, um, uh, the, the glaucous and green forms deserve uh, adequate formal taxonomic treatment, which hasn't happened yet, but it's in progress. Um, I'm going to go back to the landscapes now. Um, these are the beautiful um, aspects of that study area that I know and love, and I'm sure you do too. That's a, another population the green form of Dudley. Uh, and here's some of the issues of the development that has happened in that area. And the obvious thing is, is that the loss of, of uh, biodiversity and vegetation, but it also makes it harder to access for study. And then the remaining bits like this, well, that's somebody's front yard, number one. And number two, it's not going to last very long. But that, that site happens to be a specific population of the, the hybrid uh, swarm that I had studied years before. And there are several examples like this. So to conclude, the current state of development of the study area has caused the loss of genetically unique populations. Of course, that's a duh. But um, the, the, the other part that I would like to emphasize, despite all of this uh, uh, loss is that area is so rich and there are, are still really important things to be um, uh, conserved there. So the glass is definitely half full. Um, observing these sites 40 years ago when the landscape was more intact really facilitated the discovery of, of this phenomenon. And would it be noticed today if not uh, under the current state of development? No. Um, I think not. Although you would be able to, knowing what's known now, you could go back and reconstruct most of this, except it's really hard to find the uh, green population in the area of overlap, except where they're going with glaucus, just because of development. Uh, the peninsula, this is the most important point. The peninsula and northwestern Baja in general provides unique opportunities for research 
uh, to investigate scientific phenomena that may have importance far beyond that area. So it's, and losing the ability to learn from the landscape uh, is really an unrecognized uh, cost of, or underrecognized cost of rapid uh, development. And this, I hope to you, underscores yet another, um, from another perspective, the importance of maintaining intact habitat in this just beautiful and diverse region. And I thank you. I think there will be time for questions, which I really, and suggestions, which I welcome. And, Thank <laughs> you.